This is a 75 year old man with an, a large ulcerated nodule on the dorsal hand. Okay. So here's one area. Here's a closer look. Here's another area. Not good, not good at all. I'll show you all, all four of the slides and then we'll go back. Here's more. And as you can tell, this is a very large specimen. This was also taken out by a sarcoma surgeon, an orthopedic oncologist because of the large size and the depth of involvement of this lesion. And you can see that, you know, we've got skin here and in dermis, this used to be subcutis, but is now mostly fibrosed. And then look at that. I mean, this is tendon. This is part of the extensor tendon and the tumor is all the way down, wrapping around the extensor tendons on the dorsal hand. I mean, you know, there's not a lot of depth between the epidermis and the bone on the, the hands, on the dorsal part especially, or on the digits. So when a tumor gets bad there, it can get really bad really quickly. All right. And here, this was from another area. This patient had multiple lesions that were had actinic keratosis, squamous cell carcinoma in situ, or Bowen's disease if you prefer and had multiple lesions in addition to the large one that I showed you there. Okay. So the, the thing about this case that struck me is that the patient has a very nasty, bad squamous cell carcinoma. Very infiltrative. I think I would call it moderately differentiated. Uh, differentiation is somewhat subjective and very infiltrative most characteristically. You could also wonder, could there be some sweat duct differentiation? In this case, we felt that those, the vacuoles were artifactual and not true duct formation, but I think it would be fair to think about if there could be a sweat duct uh, carcinoma. Uh, but here, much of the lesion looked very much like a, an aggressive squamous cell carcinoma. But what struck me when I saw the case was areas like this. It's common to have brisk inflammation under squamous cell carcinomas or even under basal cell carcinoma, actinic keratosis, squamous cell carcinoma in situ. I often see dense inflammation, lymphocytes and plasma cells particularly right underneath those tumor. But here, in addition to being right underneath the tumor, there were areas well away from the main tumor mass that had a dense infiltrate. And when I went down to look at them, I thought, wow, Look at how perfectly round those lymphocytes are. I will not lie to you. I'm not a big fan of hematopathology. I find it very difficult, and it just doesn't click with my neurons, okay? Like, I'm thankful that I have really smart colleagues. I have a, a colleague down the hall from me who is a dermatopathologist who specializes in skin lymphomas, and we actually have a little trading system. When I get a biopsy that I'm like, this is gonna be a heme path entity, I go and trade it to her and she'll give me a, like a spindle cell tumor or a vulvar biopsy or something. And so we have a good system, it works. I'm okay like not being an expert at this because it's really hard for me. But I thought, wow, those look kind of fascinating because of the perfect roundness. I've recognized that I really like cells that are perfectly round. Like I love glomus tumors because something aesthetically about that perfect roundness is just like satisfying to my soul, I don't know, maybe you're different, but when I see lymphocytes that are perfectly round and small, I think of chronic lymphocytic leukemia or a small lymphocytic lymphoma. And that's what this patient had. So unfortunately, and I wish I would have, this was a long time ago and I did not take pictures of the stain, but these were diffusely positive for CD20 and for CD5. And we didn't at that time have a left one or those markers. And I think cyclin D1 was totally negative. And I, the main thing, as I said, this looks like CLL, SLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So when you have that thought, the first step is look at the patient's chart and see if they have a history of that. Because sometimes I had one just recently where I looked and I thought, this looks kind of like CLL. And sure enough, patient had a known history for a long time. They just didn't write that down on the sheet 
you know, because they weren't worried. It was a basal cell carcinoma, but it had a background of chronic lymphocytic leukemia, incidentally. So, um, so one, check the history. Number two, check if they've had a complete blood count, because then you can look and see if they have lymphocytosis, right? That can be a useful clue. Remember that squamous cell carcinoma is very common, and so is chronic lymphocytic leukemia in the same population, elderly patients, right? So it's something that's out there. I have seen this multiple times, and I've seen a couple of times where it was not known previously, and this is one of those times. And when I called up the surgeon and said, hey, this patient has a bad squamous cell carcinoma, all the way down to tendon, I think there was perineural also in here, if I recall. And I said, and also they have background um, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and I said, heme path is working it up further. And you know you should check their blood and get them you know seen by hematopatho by oncology to do bone marrow or, or whatever additional workup is needed. So he said, "Wow," he said, "That's really interesting because this patient has numerous squamous cell carcinomas on his face, like as if he were a transplant patient. And as you know, transplant patients, because of the immunosuppression, have a tendency to develop many squamous cell carcinomas. And sometimes they can be very aggressive squamous cell carcinomas. And so he said, this patient almost seems like a transplant, but has never had a transplant. And I said, it's because his immune system is wiped out by being overrun by chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And so in this case, that's exactly what was happening. Uh, they did further workup. His bone marrow was almost completely effaced by chronic lymphocytic leukemia. If I recall correctly, he had like large cell transformation or so-called Richter transformation. And then let me pull these up to see if I can show you. So unfortunately, the patient had to have a partial amputation of their hand because even with that very large excision, margins were still positive. And so they went back and they partially amputated the hand. And they also took out regional lymph nodes, which were enlarged. And you know, I see a lot of cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas, but it's pretty rare overall to see ones that metastasize to lymph nodes or distantly. But this patient had, I think, 25 lymph nodes removed. 20 of them were positive for squamous cell carcinoma. Very aggressive behavior. And here is the lymph node filled with squamous cell carcinoma. And in the background, the node architecture is effaced by a sheet of small B cells, completely overrun by chronic lymphocytic leukemia, small lymphocytic lymphoma. Here, this was one of the, and I don't know a lot of hematopathology, but when I see diffuse sheets of cells, Lymphocytes, that's bad, right? I know like lymph node's not supposed to do that. Should have like some germinal centers and you can see the little, I think they call them proliferation centers, right? Those little pale areas. Any hematopathologist here probably knows. So I thought this was a very, um, it was a case that made me really aware of how problematic this can be. I don't know the final outcome of this patient, but I, I suspect that it was not good, unfortunately. And there have been some publications about this that patients with CLL, SLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, that they have a tendency to have more aggressive squamous cell carcinomas. And I thought this was a really, um, a very eye-opening case for me. So what it's taught me is now I look more carefully, where did it go? When I see lymphocyte inflammation right under a squamous cell carcinoma or basal cell, I don't go and do CD20 on every single case. I mean, you can if you want, but I feel like I see it all the time, especially if it's mixed with plasma cells and other stuff. But if I see a diffuse, very homogenous, small lymphocytes, particularly if I see them like this, perivascular away from the main tumor out at the side, I've seen that and now multiple times by looking and staining, I've picked up CLL in the background skin. And you know, CLL is not curable, is my understanding currently, but it can be treated and sometimes that treatment can improve quality of life and delay the onset of more aggressive side effects of that disease. So it's worth identifying and picking up on earlier rather than later. Um, and so I thought that I have a low threshold. So what I do is if I think it might be there, I use a panel of three stains, CD20, CD5, and CD3. And the goal of that is to sort out you CD3 stains the T cells, 
CD20 stains, the B cells, if they're just a mixture, it's probably reactive. If they're predominantly 20 positive and co-express 5, then it's probably chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Although, of course, there are other CD5 positive small B cells like, like um, a mantle cell lymphoma, which I used to say you'll never see mantle cell, car I'm sorry, a mantle cell lymphoma in the skin. Well, if you do it long enough, you will. And I did see a case of a patient who had an internal systemic mantle cell, went to the skin, and without the history, I wouldn't have known. So this is why hematopathologists have a lot of job security going into the future, because it just keeps getting more and more complicated. I mean, I only graduated residency uh, 11 years ago. There's all sorts of stuff that didn't exist back then. In just, just 11 years, it's kind of, kind of overwhelming sometimes. So look for this in the background. See it? Look at that. And then consider doing that. So then if I do see uh, CD5 positive B cells, then I usually will consult with my hematopathology colleagues. Um, and then they can get a patient's uh, a clinical oncology workup. Okay, any questions? Oh, here, I actually, before we go, I did um, take a close-up picture of the cytology that I had, um, uh, not from a digital side, but to get really close with the high dry. And you can see that, that kind of um, a football pattern or soccer ball to Americans, <laughs> spotted, speckled kind of pattern of clustered uh, chromatin condensation that is supposed to be very classic for chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Although I have seen cases that were not as perfectly round and did not have clear cuts, so the uh, clear cut uh, nuclei that looked like this. So uh, you know, don't expect that every case will look perfect. You, know, you have to have just the right um, preparation and, and sectioning to get a really good classic example. But I've seen ones that were kind of not nearly as, as pretty and, and classic here. So, so I do have a low index of, uh, or I mean, a, a low threshold for doing stains if I'm uncertain. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. I see um, training interest. Uh, someone said that they're a hematopathologist interested in dermatopathology. God bless you. We need more people to come into uh, to dermpath that like hemopath. And then um, you would add CD23 if the phenotype is 20 and 5. And CD23 can raise the possibility of a B uh, CLL. Thank you, Dr. Isolin, uh, for that uh, comment. And then the question is, is it sort of a homing phenomenon? Are the cells homing into the squamous cell carcinoma? I don't know. It's a good question. Are these cells there because of the squamous cell? Or are these cells there throughout the patient's skin and it's just that the squamous cell carcinoma got sampled? I suspect that usually it's probably the latter because I've seen times where there clearly was a basal and you just see the perivascular infiltrate in the background skin. And also in those times, um, I think usually, you know, it, the, if the patient has a known history of CLL, whether or not there's some, some incidental involvement of the skin is probably not really clinically useful information, right? It's different in a patient with acute leukemia, right? Acute myeloid leukemia involving the skin is a serious problem. It's a medical emergency, basically. But in a patient with known CLL, that's maybe they're under treatment, but they're, they're going to always have some circulating CLL cells. It's not surprising to me that sometimes those cells incidentally settle into the skin. I mean, they're part of the normal lymphocyte component for that patient now that they have it. So, so I, I suspect it's an incidental finding, uh, but perhaps there is some homing going on. That's a great question. And then the finest thing is, does this, the squamous cell carcinoma has a, a, sometimes a spindle cell morphology? Is it worth mentioning? Well, that is a, it is a good question. Yes, if you see spindle cell squamous cell carcinoma, to me, that represents poorly differentiated, kind of sarcomatoid or spindle cell squamous cell carcinoma. I think of as analogous to poorly differentiated. I can't recall if this lesion actually had really good spindle component. Maybe it did. I felt like much of the spindle cell in the background was reactive myofibroblast, kind of desmoplastic stromal response. But sometimes it can be hard to tell them apart, and you can try to use immunostains, although spindle cell squamous cell carcinoma sometimes loses uh, it's keratin markers and can lose also even P63 and P40 sometimes. So yes, it is worth mentioning. Here, it didn't really seem to matter. This was clearly aggressive, regardless of what name or grading we put on this, this was an aggressive bad tumor.
But yes, usually if I see a true spindle cell squamous cell carcinoma component, I'll report it as poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma with spindle cell features. That's the terminology I use. 